Uh, I had the, the pleasure of being the organizer of the Dash In Colloquium, so I could um, I like it. I'm, well, I'm, I'm really happy about my achievement with this one, so it's, it's really great. Um, the Roger Dash In Memorial Colloquium was endowed by Roger's wife. Uh, to bring in renowned scientists. Roger died in 1995 at the age of 57. He had a huge presence and impact in science, ranging from high energy theory to applying the path integral to, this, to studying detecting objects in the oceans. And he also had a huge impact in our department. So I, maybe by a show of hands, how many people here uh, interacted with Roger? Um, so I didn't, but I'm sure that many, I'm sure that he would be happy about today's Dash in Memorial Colloquium. And also, I would encourage uh, students and everyone to regularly attend the colloquia to find out what's going on in other fields and to see the synergy in human physics, which I think is something that Roger uh, appreciated. So um, prior to September 14th, 2015, which was day zero of gravitational wave detection era, we had many colloquia here at UCSD on the LIGO collaboration from uh, various people with updates. And the common feeling afterwards was that this was a heroic effort, which probably had a negligible chance, chance for success within our lifetimes. The aim to make the most precise ruler ever built, measuring the motion of a mirror to one ten thousandth of, of the radius of a proton or less. And it just was hard to, to imagine what that could even mean. But wow, they actually did it. And so this is, I think, a good lesson for all of us that sometimes these kinds of incredible gambles, which might take years to pay off, really can hit the jackpot. So we're delighted to have today the heroic leader of the LIGO effort, Barry Barish, did his PhD in experimental particle physics at UC Berkeley. And he led the high energy experiments on various fronts from the early 1960s to the mid 1990s. He was at Caltech since 1963, so we overlapped there with Roger, and he was the lead PI of Caltech's High Energy Experimental Group up until 1996. Um, and then he transitioned to become the PI of the LIGO uh, collaboration in 1994 and the director in 1997. And again, this was a heroic effort to keep the LIGO dream alive and on track and funded by the NSF for all of these years. And then four years ago, they actually did it. So they ushered in a new way to see the universe by observing the oscillations of the fabric of space-time. So Barry, of course, has a long list of awards, including the Nobel Prize from two years ago. And without further ado, let's welcome Barry Barry. Hi. Uh, I haven't been here for at least a decade, actually, and it's nice to be back. Um, I'm going to try to be somewhat uh, forward-looking today. So I'm not going to just concentrate on showing you what we did, uh, which I will show you, but I'm, I'll shortcut that a bit because I, I want to talk about more about, a little bit at least, about where, what we're doing now and where I think this is going in the, in the future so that you can do that first. Let me comment, uh, as Ken did, that I came to Caltech uh, in, as a postdoc because of Richard Feynman, actually, in 1963. And when I arrived at Caltech, Roger Dashen was a graduate student there. He came to Caltech in uh, 1960 as a graduate student from Harvard. And he was just finishing up when I came. And the graduate students and postdocs were kind of around. Uh, we were pretty crowded together. So I got to know him uh, right away. Uh, he was just finishing his PhD at that point. And uh, his PhD was, uh, I don't know what the PhD, I think it was on, I know what he was working on was the mass difference between the neutron and the proton. Uh, and working for Steve Frouchy at that uh, <clears throat> at that point, but he was also uh, very involved with uh, Murray Gelman, and uh, he got his PhD or finished that work quite quickly soon after I got there in 1964, and then he was working on trying to use current algebra, which is what uh, Murray was doing at that point, 
to develop a dynamical theory of hadrons. That was their goal. And he worked on various things quickly on that. In 1966, I thought I was being doing pretty well, having come as a postdoc in 1964 by getting made a faculty member as an assistant professor at Caltech, only to find out down the hall that Roger also was made a faculty member, only he was made a full professor immediately. <laughs> so uh, that tells you a, a little bit. He, this was part of the fact that uh, he was fantastic, but also the fact that he was being recruited from Princeton along with Steve Adler at that point. And in fact, he left for Princeton. I, I knew him after that, but more from a distance. But uh, during that short period at Caltech, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to know him. This picture was taken at Princeton soon after he left from Caltech. I couldn't find one at, at Caltech itself. So let me reflect a little bit before I talk about LIGO, about astronomy. Because a big part of what we'll do with gravitational waves after we uh, <coughs> have tested Einstein and maybe found something there or that side of it uh, is to do astronomy in a new way. And how is that going to fit in? And where does it work? And I, I, let me just reflect a little bit on my view as a physicist of astronomy a little bit. In the 20th century, it'll, maybe mostly the last half of the 20th century, the big advance, I think, in astronomy that's led to so much information is that we changed from just viewing optical astronomy as the tool to do astronomy to doing astronomy at all the different wavelengths, uh, everything from the radio uh, to high energy gamma rays. And of course, we're still doing that, having instruments that are looking at all the wavelengths and maybe looking at the same phenomenon. For example, here are a bunch of different uh, astronomical instruments looking at the Crab Nebula. So this is, gives us the ability to, of course, study the science of these different objects with all these different uh, wavelengths. And that was a huge advance, I think, generally for astronomy. And now we have fantastic instruments, and we'll have better ones in the future in all these uh, different wavelengths. So that's kind of lesson one. We've also learned very, very recently, um, this last spring, I think, was the dramatic result of this, that we can also do astronomy and gain by combining instruments together as one instrument. In this case, this was using the major radio telescopes in the world uh, that are spread around from the South Pole to uh, Europe and Asia, and combine them as one instrument. Keep in mind that these were never made to be put together as one instrument. They have different features and different readouts and so forth. So it was really a very uh, major effort starting from something that already existed, <coughs> sorry, to being able to put them together. And from that, they brought all the data together. This has been going on for so long. They pointed to a black hole called M87, and we all saw this beautiful first image of a black hole that appeared even more on the, what do they call it, above the fold in the New York Times, above Trump that day, <laughs> uh, last, last spring. So uh, this is bringing together different instruments. These, to me, are just kind of general lessons as we move to what I think is the next big step. And we've made just a little inroad into that, which I'll show you, which is to do what we like to call multi-messenger astronomy. That is, don't just use the electromagnetic spectrum, but try to use any other way to detect things. So what is that? In the electromagnetic, I just pointed out, we have instruments in all the different wavelengths. The second is to use something very different, that is gravity, our gravitational waves. And we presently have LIGO, and we'll have future instruments that are better. And thirdly, we can use particles that come, or neutrinos. So the combination of these in the future is a way to understand the physics that produces, for example, the neutrinos, the astronomy that may give all the electromagnetic waves, gravitation, which is a very different force, and be able to understand whatever we're pursuing in astronomy that much more. We already have an example of it which we got from LIGO, which I'll uh, talk about briefly. 
in this lecture, but I'm trying to cover a lot of territory. So now let me go back so we can start from the beginning. Uh, for those of you that haven't ever, never seen what we've done, what we accomplished, and we'll start from that, and I'll give a kind of brief history of that. <clears throat> we all learned gravity somewhere in elementary school by our teacher telling us when we jump up, the earth pulls us down, and the apple falling out of the tree, and so forth and so on. And we even got a formula that was given to us by Newton in 1680s in the Principia when he wrote his theory of what he called unified gravity. Uh, unify, universal, because basically it describes gravity, whether it's the planets going, the moon going around the earth, the earth around the sun, the tides, or whatever else involved, the apple falling out of the tree. That theory is arguably the most, most successful physics theory of all time. But we basically replaced it, or have added to it, with Einstein's theory of gravity, which was brought in 1915. So this is a different theory of gravity. I'll try to give you an indication of kind of how science develops. This doesn't mean Newton's theory was wrong, but what is it about Newton's theory that had to inspire us knows, knowing something more about gravity, which is what Einstein in a new theory brought us? So the equivalent formula is shown here, which I won't describe in any detail, and, but physically, it's bringing space and time into one four-dimensional uh, unified space-time. And this is basically the idea underneath, underneath Einstein's theory. With that theory, uh, we basically have a consequence, which is gravitational waves. And that consequence basically comes about because of the accelerations of two objects, for example, in what we detected, so I'll just pick that as an example, going around each other like this. Einstein showed in 1918, two years after, by the way, he proposed gravitational waves in 1916, one year after he came out with the theory of general relativity. In that uh, period where he proposed gravitational waves, he didn't develop it from fundamental theory. He basically just instead noticed that if he set up the equations of general relativity in a particular way, they look like the equations of, of uh, uh, electromagnetic waves. And I think I'm going to show that to you on the next slide. Uh, and because of that, he just basically made the leap, being Einstein, that there must be gravitational waves since there are electromagnetic waves. Didn't prove it. This didn't really get much traction in the physics community, first quantum mechanics was coming in, and uh, this was not a proof of anything. It was a conjecture. And he also made the statement that it, the effect was so small that it wouldn't be detectable. Of course, he couldn't envision modern lasers and optics and so forth that we used to make the detection. So what is his theory? If I tried to formulate it for you, I can't do general relativity in this lecture or we won't finish. But if I set it up in a particular way, and just to satisfy those that understand it, I say what I'm doing on the left-hand side. Uh, it looks like a familiar equation, and that is the equation of electricity and magnetism, which I show here, uh, with a different symbol, h mu nu. h mu nu is the fundamental, what's called the strain in general relativity, and it's the measurable parameter that we measure when there's gravitational waves. So this equation for people who know electricity and magnetism should look basically familiar. Looking at that equation, as I say, you can read the left to see what I did to set it up that way. Uh, but then if I have the equation, then of course it's going to have the same features as electromagnetic radiation. It's going to have uh, 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 plane waves and two polarizations, just like are shown here. And the strain, that little h, is the magnitude. And the speed, in Einstein's theory, is the one speed he has in general relativity. The speed of, we call the speed of light, but it's, just, it's basically the speed. So it goes at the speed of light. You'll notice in my picture, though, these two polarizations are not at 90 degrees to each other. 
That's because basically gravity is spin two, and so they're at 45 degrees instead of 90 degrees to each other. And just like in electromagnetism, they're separable. We haven't done very much yet, a little bit, of being able to separate them. I probably won't have time to talk about that very much, but separating the two polarizations is completely doable experimentally. We just haven't gotten to where we've done very much on that yet. So uh, what are the gravitational waves themselves? First, they uh, are some, some in his formulation, which is a formulation of space-time. They're ripples in space-time itself. They go, these ripples go at the speed of light, and the amplitude is very small. So let me just say, where does that all come from? First, in classical gravitation, in, in the classical theory, there is nothing like, say, the equivalent of a photon or let's say in this case a graviton. So these waves don't have an accompanying photon equivalent that we know of. So in the classical theory, they travel as just ripples or distortions traveling at the speed of light in space itself. That's a little bit like throwing a stone in a pond, still pond, the stone goes to the bottom, the originally the waves, and the waves which are just part of the water propagate out, of course, not at the speed of light. So the gravitational waves are the same. Why are they so small? They're not so small necessarily because of the equations I've shown you. They're small, basically, if I wanted to characterize it by the fact that maybe fortunately for a lot of other reasons, space itself is incredibly stiff. So if you think of the wave as like the on the pond distorting the space itself, Space has a characteristic, if I used a Young's modulus or something, that it's just incredibly stiff. So that the gravitational waves just don't distort it very much. That distortion in what I'll show you is about one part in 10 to the 21. So it's a very small number, which is the origin of what we have to detect. The, um, Effect itself is shown here. If I were to have a ring of free masses and then a gravitational wave came through, what's it going to do? It's going to make a distortion. I've said the amplitude, one part in 10 to the 21, so I'll exaggerate it in the picture. And it has a frequency. It's a traveling wave, so it has some frequency. What it'll do is to distort this circle of free masses a little bit so that it got elliptical in one direction, and then as the half a wavelength later, it goes toward the other direction. And so it goes back and forth between making it taller and thinner, shorter and fatter, but only one part in 10 to the 21. A little bit like going to an amusement park where there's a mirror that makes you tall and thin, short and fat, and you go back and forth between those. So that's what we try to measure. And if the size of the circle were one meter, then we'd have to measure uh, the distortion 20, 10 to the minus 21 meters. That's why we make the thing big. So we make it kilometers instead of a meter in order to make this number a little bit more palatable, and it brings it up to 10 to the minus 18 meters, still a 1 1,000th the size of a proton that we have to measure. So that's the challenge. And the scheme that we have is well adapted to that because it measures small differences in two different directions. What's shown here is a schematic of an interferometer. I'll show the waves coming in a minute. The waves come, you split the beam and send it two directions. If the distance is the same, you set it so it'll be the same with no gravitational wave. When the two beams come back, you set them so they cancel each other, exactly canceling. And in the detector that's shown on the right, you see no signal. But if the two arms change length a little bit relative to each other, they can add and give you some signal. And that's the fundamental technique that's used. And that's interferometry. In general, as an experimental physicist, we're talking about measuring an incredibly small number. And we, have, we know how hard it is to measure an absolute number. We have a, uh, uh, 
institution that measures the size, the weight of a kilogram or the size of a meter stick and so forth. Uh, uh, the absolute size of something's hard to measure, but as an experimentalist, sometimes a very small difference is easier to measure. We're lucky here in that the effect is very well suited to interferometry. The only problem is how do you make interferometry good enough to be able to do this problem? So what are the challenges if I just simplify them as much as I can and what we had to do to be able to do this interferometrically? So you can see this is a possible technique for seeing the effect. I show the challenge here that the little h on the top, which is the strain, is a change of length over length. That's fine. It's one part in 10 to the minus 21. And we're going to make the detector, in our case, four kilometers. So we have to measure some part in 10 to the minus 18. That, if I just boil it down, gives us two challenges. And they're pretty steep and difficult. The first one is that we have to be able to measure the interferometry to one part in 10 to the 12th of the wavelength of the light used in the interferometer. So many of you have used an interferometer in a freshman or sophomore lab, or maybe in something somewhat more sophisticated. And in the freshman or sophomore lab, you see a bunch of fringes. And maybe in your lab, you measured something to one tenth of a fringe or something like that. And in a more sophisticated instrument, maybe people have done it to one one hundredth or one thousandth the, the wavelength of the light. We had to do it to one part in 10 to the 12th. That was the first major challenge and something that we began working on uh, about 1990. And once the idea, this idea was solid and we knew how to compare with another technique, which I don't have to have time to talk about today, the ch first challenge was can you do interferometry at this level? And through the period of, oh, 1990 to implementing it and improving it, I'm out of time already, <laughs> to, to 2010, uh, we developed all the tricks and so forth, which in detail I won't go through at all, to get to a level of 10 to the minus 12. And we were there at, at some point. The second challenge, so there's two challenges, and I'll show you kind of how we got at them. The second challenge is despite the fact that we seem to walk around and everything seems stable, the Earth really moves around a lot. And you can't do what we do in the freshman or sophomore lab. In that lab, you went in and there was some sort of optical table. And you took your mirrors and you fastened them down tightly to the optical table. If you did it well, you saw the fringes. We can't do that because the optical table on the ground is moving around a huge amount compared to 10 to the minus 21 or 10 to the minus 18 meters. So we can't have this whole <clears throat> scheme of being on an optical table. We have to somehow, even though we're here on Earth, float this interferometer so that it's not affected by the movement of the Earth. Of course, we can't completely float it. So the question is, how much can we isolate it from the movement of the Earth? That was the second problem, big problem. And I've you know, oversimplified, but those are the two big problems that had to be solved. Do interferometry at a level orders of magnitude beyond anything anybody had ever tried or done. And the second is to actually isolate yourself from the Earth well beyond what people can do. So that's the problems we had to solve, and it took us a while. We convinced the NSF that we could eventually do this uh, in 1994, and that's when we got the project approved. Uh, and uh, at that point, we had to somehow make it work at, on some time. We developed a proposal that we submitted to NSF where uh, we're not allowed as you know, proposers to tell them where to put it. So we s instead had what we called sample sites in our proposal, and one of them was uh, that well, there were two institutions before that. <clears throat> in about 1990, the NSF decided there were two groups trying to develop this, one at MIT, one at Caltech, and they didn't want to pay for us both. So they forced us into a marriage together. 
and we started working together, this very unlikely marriage, uh, in 1991, but it's been a successful one, despite the fact that it seemed unnatural at the time. Anyway, we started working together in 1990. We wrote this proposal in 1993, submitted it to the NSF. In that proposal, we put, we had to show how we would implement it, isolate ourselves from the ground, everything else. So we had one sample site that was uh, near Caltech, actually in the Edward, near the Edwards Air Force Base out in the desert, high desert, and one in southern Maine, not so distant from MIT, sounds logical. We put it in the government. We're happy because they funded us. But you'll notice they rotated it by 45 degrees. And you can guess why. We ended up with uh, strong uh, supporting senators in those two states. So uh, funding is not, but in case I forget, the big heroes of this whole thing are the NSF. They approved us in 1994. That was one miracle. They stayed with us until more than 21 years before we made a detection, which is a double miracle that they somehow through four different directors uh, stayed with us through this whole, whole not uncontroversial attempt. So anyway, we end up with two detectors, which I'll describe. I show a picture of them in a, in a minute, uh, 3,000 kilometers apart. So 3,000 kilometers apart means the speed of light takes 10 milliseconds to go from one to the other. So if I were to have a gravitational wave come this way, it would hit Hanford 10 milliseconds before this one, come this way 10 milliseconds before, and if it comes down this way, they'd be at the same time, which means we set a requirement that they be coincident within plus or minus 10 milliseconds. Then we look at off times, that is when this one happens more than 10 milliseconds away from this one, as a way to measure whether there's anything that gives signals that uh, are just happening in the instruments that give us background, and that we do all the time. Um, so that was 1994. This is what we built. You can guess which one's in Louisiana. This is, this is uh, Louisiana here. Notice in Louisiana, this is water. Uh, the water table is about a millimeter below the dirt. And uh, in order to keep from being flooded, we did what you do in a highway, that is build a big berm. You can't see it very well, I'm sorry. You can't see it very well in this picture, but basically this part is built up to about five meters above the level so that when it floods, which is not uncommon, uh, the apparatus is okay. Building it up to five meters meant that uh, this part down here was the borrow pit that we got the dirt to build it up. It immediately filled with water, catfish, alligators, and so forth. Then the local hunters came and killed the alligators. It was kind of interesting. The other one is on a DOE site. That's a different interest. Uh, it's on the Hanford Reservation where the reactors were that were used for separating uh, uh, in the world for separation in World War II. And uh, we're way out in the fringes of that uh, all by ourselves. So we don't deal with uh, as many interesting local problems. There are different problems, institutional problems with the DOE. We're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. They come and pick up our mail and deliver it. So our graduate students write to their girlfriend. They take those nicely out. They'll only do business mail. So you, know, you deal with the deal. To, to build the site, you have to have water to do anything construction-wise. We dug down and the distance we were told by the civil people, we didn't hit any water. Getting permission from the DOE on the Hanford site to go another five meters deeper was uh, a major undertaking. You can imagine why. So anyway, so we put these things together. What are they supposed to do? This is a picture of what is supposed to happen just schematically. What's shown is on the left is a sensitivity. Notice it says H, same H. And 10 to the minus 21 on this schematic view is here. 10 to the minus 22, this is more sensitive going down. 
So the sensitivity, and this is a log scale. Down here is frequency. So what we're first sensitive to on the Earth's surface is where we can make the Earth the quietest. And that turns out to be the same band our ears have learned that the Earth is quietest by evolution. That is what we call the audio band. We have nothing to do with audio, but it's really, if you go to lower frequency, um, the Earth is, is too noisy and our ears cut off so we don't get bothered by all that noise. And at the highest frequencies, our ears can't sample fast enough. So it cuts off between 10 and 10,000 hertz. We're in the same frequency band and really for the same fundamental reasons, it's the motion of the Earth. So that's the sensitivity band that's available to us on the Earth. I'll mention later what's available in space. So what limits us on the Earth? First, the shaking of the Earth itself. That's shown here as seismic. And it falls as frequency to the fourth power. It's incredibly steep. That's why our ears cut off. It gets really, really noisy. And so we have to beat that to get the low frequencies. That turns out to be absolutely what mattered for making the detection, which I'll show you. At high frequencies, we're cut off for the same reasons as your ear cuts off. You have to sample faster and faster at high frequencies. And so you don't have as much time, you get less signal. And it's the same thing for us. We get so many photons in the interferometer as we go to high frequencies, it's less and less photons in the frequency band. And so that's what causes this to go up. The middle band is the fact that we, we have an interferometer where we had mirrors. Those mirrors are made out of atoms and molecules and, um, and materials. And in that there's KT noise, Brownian motion. And so the motion of the atoms moving around is basically the limitation. And that's shown here as basically thermal noise. It's KT noise. And then all these lines below are what lurks to beat us if we manage to move these down far enough. For example, residual gas. So if we make a normal vacuum pipe, we're pretty close to where we wanna be. And that's not safe enough because we wanna make this better and better. And so instead we made a vacuum system that is an order of magnitude or so below there. And it's therefore <clears throat> the largest high vacuum system in the world, larger than the CERN high vacuum system because all of CERN has a bigger vacuum system, but not high vacuum. High vacuum for us is more than 10 to the minus nine tor, the units that are used for vacuum. And the other uh, problems are shown here. And so the sensitive region where you can detect gravitational waves are something that's above all these basically background issues. And that's where we search. So gravitational waves can come in something that gives one frequency. That would, for example, be a spinning neutron star or pulsar that has a quadrupole moment. Or it can be something like I'll show you, which is a in spiral, which basically changes frequency with time and crosses this band in time. And that's what I'll show you. So we built this into LIGO, our best attempt. Uh, we told the NSF from the beginning that uh, we would get in the beginning to a sensitivity where <clears throat> detecting gravitational waves was possible, but not probable meaning that we didn't break any physical laws. The gravitational waves could give us signals, but we didn't know of any sources that were strong enough to be at that level, but we were way beyond anything anybody had uh, ever done in the past. In the meantime, we would build an infrastructure, which is the main cost, that was capable of improving the sensitivity beyond that. We gave plausibility arguments for how we could improve it another factor of at least 10 and asked to be also funded to develop the technologies that would be used to do that during the time we ran the initial version of LIGO. So this is the history of the initial version of LIGO. We built it between 1995 and 2000. We turned it on and you can notice it looks like this shape. So this is the design. We came down here, this is a log scale so you can see we started orders of magnitude from the design, and the design is above where we think we have to detect. 
And we ran it, made it work like an interferometer. It already was working better than anything people had used <clears throat> previously to look for gravitational waves, which were primarily big bars of aluminum. And we would run it for six months or so, lick our wounds, fix things, put in improvements, and run it again. And this is just a series of about five years to bring it down, at least at all the frequencies except the very lowest, to the uh, level here. We didn't see any gravitational waves. During that same period, this brings us up to maybe 204 or 5, we did develop the technologies. I'm going to concentrate on one because it's what made the detection. We uh, worked on the design, the technologies we would need to gain another factor of 10. A factor of 10 isn't just a factor of 10. The, that's a factor of 10 in our ability to measure this little h, the strain. What we measure in gravitational waves, fortunately, is an amplitude, not a power because we measure the stretching and so forth. So we basically are measuring an amplitude. That means that if we improve the sensitivity a factor of two, we look a factor of two further out into the universe, and that's a factor of eight, two cubed, in the amount of stars, galaxies, and so forth. So our goal was to get another factor of 10, which would be a factor of 1,000 improvement in what you get. So we have this nice multiplying factor. And we put a major proposal into the NSF in 2004 to do this. They approved it. And uh, then we had to stand in line and wait for money for five years. And during that time, I worked on designing a linear collider. So then they funded us. And we built it. And I won't go through all of this. We changed almost everything. Better lasers, better optics, uh, better mirrors, so forth and so on. Uh, that we did. I'll skip all that. But basically, all inside the same infrastructure. And so the cost is, even though it's very sophisticated, was much less than the original LIGO, since we used all the, the big vacuum tanks, the tubes, the vessels, and so forth, which from the beginning, we designed to be able to fit uh, what we hadn't designed yet in improvements. So I'll pick only one technology, and it's the one that mattered. So if you need the elevator speech to tell somebody what it took to detect gravitational waves, wake up for the next two slides. Uh, that is, how did we manage to isolate ourselves from the Earth? This is a pretty simple story. So the first thing is that we do, people have developed a pretty good technique for doing that that we use every day. And that's the shock absorbers in your cars. So what does a shock absorber in your car do? When you go over a bump, and in the early days cars did that, it went you know, bumped up. But instead, we put in this shock absorber in the car. The shock absorber can't get rid of the energy. It's there. But instead, it's kind of squishy. And so it takes the bump and changes it from a high frequency bump to a low frequency, same integral of energy, low frequency, and you just feel yourself go a little bit over a bump. So why can't we use the same way to get the seismic shaking in our frequency band and move it out of our frequency band? So we undertook to make the world's greatest shock absorbers. And this we did, started designing in the early 1990s. And they basically consist of of springs, the springs made out of special material with just the right gushiness so that it'll take the frequencies that we care about and move them to lower frequency. Not only that, we took four different layers of them so that what isn't captured by the first gets taken by the second, the third, the fourth. However, that all is vertical. The Earth doesn't just move vertically, it also moves horizontally. So to take care of the horizontal, we basically take the test mass and make it into a pendulum. If I hang a pendulum and I move the top, it doesn't do very much to the bottom. So I can move around the top without doing very much to the bottom. And in fact, in order to make this really right, our pendulum, which is shown on the left, is a quadruple pendulum. 
so that each layer is separate from the others. And we have controls on the top three that can compensate. And the bottom one has nothing on it. And it's our test mess. That's a complicated um, pendulum to do, to work with, instead of uh, working with just the bottom one. But it's what we had to do to the horizontal part. In detail, it looks a little more complicated, as you can imagine. And I'm not going to talk about that. But the factor that we needed was the factor of 10 to the minus 12. OK. So what I showed you is the, when I showed you all those limits, is shown here. This was the best we did with the original version of LIGO. The calculated uh, performance, if we made everything work right, is this line here. And we could change the optics a little bit to emphasize the high frequencies compared to the low frequencies. And that's what the red one is, for example, to try to make a better high frequency at the cost of it being somewhat worse at low frequency. So our goal then was to make a new version of LIGO that would be factor of 10 better or a factor of 1,000 better in how much volume of the universe it could look at. And that's shown here. This is this same curve that's over here. And the desire was to bring it down. And so this is what we did schematically. For high, power, high frequency, what you're limited by is the number of photons that are in this thing, just statistics. They uh, um, uh, call it shot noise if you're an interferometer person. If you're a particle physicist, you call it photostatistics. But you basically want to put as many photons in as possible. And then you have to worry about photon pressure on mirrors and so forth, which I won't deal with here, but you can imagine we deal with that somehow. At the medium frequencies, we have to have a better test mass to, get to eliminate the KT noise, better material, bigger and heavier, and so forth. And we did that. And at the lowest frequencies, we have to get better seismic isolation. But I showed you our seismic isolation. It was pretty good. So, but it was only one part in 10 to the 10th, not one part in 10 to the 12th. So how do we get another factor of 100 in seismic isolation? We did that by taking another mundane uh, uh, gadget that people use in regular life. And that is, most of you have gone on an airplane and put on these earphones that uh, are noise-canceling earphones. So what do they do? When you go on the plane, the earphones basically are picking up the ambient, ambient motion from the engines and actively canceling that. And it gets quiet. And magically, the stewardess comes up and talks to you, and you hear her perfectly well, even though you've got these things on. So that basically is doing an active, not just a passive, job of canceling what's in the, what's uh, coming from the engines. So of course, we have nothing to do with audio, but we just stole the idea again. And our problem is a little bit harder, because in our case, we have to somehow sense what has escaped the passive isolation and compensate for it actively. So what we did is develop uh, sensors, basically seismic sensors, that we buried inside in various ways. I won't tell you how or where. Inside this big array of, of uh, shock absorbers, measured the ambient motion, and corrected for it. And believe it or not, that gave us the, other, the last factor of 100. And uh, you can see that over here. If you look on the right, we, so we were funded in about 2010 or 11, as I said. And then we built LIGO, the advanced LIGO over three or four years. We started putting it together in 2013 or 14. And we immediate, it, it all is, we can't make it all work at full power on lasers and everything from the beginning. So like for initial LIGO, it takes some steps to get it all working. But after trying to use the new version of LIGO for about six or eight months uh, in testing, we ended up here. This is where we were at the beginning. This is where we are until we tested. The two colors are the two different interferometers. You can see they perform the same. And this is the design. So we weren't there yet. This, we didn't have full power in the lasers. 
uh, we didn't have the seismic totally tuned, and we have some residual noise, uh, which takes time to get rid of all these. By the way, these vertical lines are all there in any sensitive apparatus. These are, are resonances that are either electronic, like 60 hertz, multiples of 60 hertz, or mechanical, because any mount you have has some resonant frequencies. They correspond to about 1% of the uh, area of the length, and we notch those all out. So that's what those little are. They don't, they don't matter for anything else. So we got down to here, and notice at high frequency, we had improved a factor of three. So if we cube that, that's a factor of 27, and it would only take us a month or so, to, to get our two months, to make up for all we had done before and go beyond that. So we decided rather than continue to work on the technology for another year or so, we'll take an intermediate run at this level. Notice, though, at low frequencies, the gain is a factor of 100. And that factor of 100 is the two factor going from 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 12th by adding act something new. The others were improvements, a higher power laser and so forth. This was adding a new technology, active seismic isolation. It gave us already a factor of 100. At, I think I drew 40 hertz there. And at 40 hertz, a factor of 100 is a factor of a million in the rate for anything that's at that frequency. So we decided to run and uh, Within a week, we saw this. So this is the signal of gravitational waves as seen um, in September 2014, 2015, 2015. And you see the top one is the, what's shown is the uh, strain at 10 to the minus 21. This is one 10 to the minus 21, plus or minus. The signal gets about that big. So that was the prediction. This going this way is time. This is about two tenths of one second. And the wiggles are presumably these two objects going around each other at higher and higher frequency, the so-called chirp signal, which I'll show you in a minute. And it gets, as the two objects get closer together, it gets bigger and higher frequency. So if you look at this, these are broader than this one here. It's getting narrower and taller. And we saw six or seven uh, wiggles, and this, uh, these two signals came um, in seven milliseconds. The first one came to Louisiana, and the second one at Hanford, Washington, seven milliseconds later. The bottom one, I've superposed them on top of each other, and uh, you can see that they immediately look alike if you shift one by seven milliseconds, which isn't very much. This immediately looked like uh, gravitational waves, obviously, and I'm not going to go through this history very much. I show on the next plot, no, on the, on the right-hand side, the data from the two, for the data from the two left and right, and the calculations using Einstein's general relativity of the merger of two objects. I'll show you the parameters in a minute of the two objects. And you can see they look alike. And even more impressively, if you subtract the uh, Einstein's equations from this, you get just this wiggles, which are noise, but not, no structure of any kind, which immediately is pretty simple, but gives you a, a sense that this looked uh, like we'd really seen the right thing from the beginning. Just to emphasize, that low frequencies are what matters. This is a time frequency picture of the same data. And you'll notice that most of the signal is around 40 hertz or so, where we got the factor of 100. So this was the first uh, detection. With that detection, you can actually take these wiggles, use Einstein's equations, and determine the parameters with quite good accuracy if you know the shape well. So this is the formula you use to determine, for example, how far away it is, uh, de determination of the, therefore, the redshift, the spins, the, rate, the masses, and uh, so forth. And to second order, you can determine there's another term that I've left out, 
where you can determine things like the precession, for example. Uh, and using them together, you can tell things about the sky location, how far away it is, what the orientation is, uh, extract it as you extract it. So there's an incredible amount of information if those measurements are good enough. And that's what we did. And uh, with that, we determined, for example, for the first event, that the two objects were about 30 solar masses each, one 36, the other one 29, that uh, within three or four, four or five solar masses, they merged together. The final mass was 62 solar masses, meaning that it emitted about three solar masses of, gravitation, of energy and gravitational waves in two tenths of a second, the brightest object in terms of energy in the sky at that point, at that second, at that point in time. And we can even measure the final uh, black hole spin, for example, uh, and how far away it is. This event was 400 megaparsecs away. So that's uh, the beginning. Now, to be honest, that isn't what we expected events to look like. We were lucky. We always thought that we would not see something that you immediately know as a gravitational waves wave, but that we would have to pick it out by sensitive, by sensitive measurements in the noise. The technique is what you call um, match filtering, and I'll describe what that is in a second. First on the left is kind of how we populate the area of parameter space that's available to us. So we can see in our frequency band the merger between objects between one and 100 solar masses. One can be one, the other one 100, they can be 50-50, or somewhere in between. The different colors here are the, on the top. If it's black hole, black hole mergers, then you're in that regime. And the bottom are black hole, are black hole neutron star and neutron star, neutron star. So those are kind of the areas of space, parameter space that we covered. And we have a noisy environment like this thing on the right. And we want to see some signal. I've just drawn a shape like a signal. And we use match filtering. So how does match filtering work? It basically is shown here, looking at the bottom, by multiplying this thing that's moving through against a template that you put in here and you see a signal. So we basically, and we most of the gravitational wave events that we've seen, we identify this way, not with the naked eye like the very first uh, event. This is the second event showing it was done with a match filter. And in fact, this event, which has many, many oscillations. Even though it's down in the noise, the fact that we could measure it over and over and trace it was better in terms of, for example, testing Einstein's equations in the first one that only had six oscillations, but was very big. So this is the first couple events. I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but just to tell you we can do it. We use these to test general relativity. So we're for the first time testing general relativity in the regime that matters the most. We know general relativity works very well. Uh, for example, in the weak field, what we call the weak field limit, but for practical applications, for example, your GPS and your car wouldn't work without general relativity, which is a correction made in the satellites that travel overhead. That's the weak field limit that works very well. There could be differences from Einstein's theory in the strong field limit. Of course, near black holes is, is the strong field limit. And we don't have alternate theories that we can, can't compare by running them through the data. That would be ideal. Instead, at this point, we look for deviations from Einstein's theory. And for example, we added a dispersion term, which is what I'm showing here is just a simple example. And the dispersion term would in a limit could be a massive graviton, for example, would add a dispersion term. The dispersion term means it wouldn't all travel at all frequencies at the same velocity. It disperses the signal. We, put a, we don't see any evidence of that. We fit Einstein quite well. And therefore, we can set a limit on the mass of something like a graviton, which I did here. And it's something like 1 part in 10 to the minus uh, 7 parts in 10 to the minus 23 EV over C squared. Okay, 
now I want to kind of move on so we can talk a little bit about the future to, before we end up. The, what we very much like for the first version of LIGO, we have a whole set of improvements to get down to where the bottom line is that I showed you. And we saw these first two events that I showed you, and then we did the same thing. We turned ourselves off for six months, licked our wounds, put in improvements, and made it work better. And then we ran again. That was what is called the O2 run, observational run two. And in that run, we actually observed now and have reported 10, uh, for 10 uh, samples of black, of black hole mergers. That's starting to give us a sample of what the different masses are and so forth, which can help us understand how they originated. There's different ideas where they originated. The first uh, issue is that we've always thought, and I still think, that using a totally different probe to look at the universe, we're going to see science that's different from what we see with electromagnetic waves. And that already happened, because in the very first event, we saw 30 mass black holes, 30 some, 36 and 29, and 62 in the final version. Uh, we don't expect that from astronomers. Astronomers don't, didn't expect that because the, uh, these are thought to be stellar black holes, come from the collapse of a star after it burns up its fuel, and it's hard to have stars heavy enough to make such heavy black holes. So uh, now the question is, why, where do these heavy ones originate, and how are there regions of the universe that are depleted enough in heavy elements so that, uh, that uh, they're more stable. That's uh, called low metallicity regions, for example. Is it some region of the universe that's so dense that black holes, when they're smaller, ate each other up and build themselves up? Or maybe what particle physicists might like better, maybe they're primordial. To tell the difference between those, we need to get larger uh, samples of events and understand where they come from in terms of how what their population is in terms of distance, mass, spin. Are the two objects themselves spinning in any correlated way? Or are they uncorrelated? That's what we're trying to do as we uh, get more data. So we're just getting started on that. Anyway, we published uh, 10 events. And uh, it has this feature that they're much heavier than we thought. Near the end of that, we, we and I think I'm out of time, pretty close. <laughs> uh, <laughs> near the end of this, uh, we uh, were able for the first time to do what I brought up at the beginning, and that is be able to sky localize well enough to try to have electromagnetic components. So we had instrumented from the beginning to do this. And I show you the timeline here. Starting from LIGO itself, we have two instruments. Using two instruments, we can tell something on the sky to a ring a little bit better because they have antenna patterns, but basically a ring. You need three to triangulate. And the third one for us is what was our competitor to detect gravitational waves, but now our partner in terms of analyzing gravitational waves. That's a detector made by the French and the Italians uh, in Italy near Pisa called Virgo. If we put all three together, then in a time of just a few minutes, we can tell where something happens and announce it to the astrono astronomers, and they can take a look. And we have to do that quickly because these signals don't necessarily stay around for very long. Uh, in the meantime, to do the real analysis for us takes a long time because uh, we basically have to do uh, fits to Einstein's equations. Doing Einstein's equations on computers is a hard problem. And uh, use all kinds of fancy parameter estimation codes and so forth and so on. So uh, we make a quick analysis online, make mistakes doing that. But basically, it gets us uh, to talk to astronomers. So this is the sky localization we got using just LIGO, the two LIGO detectors. And it's pretty bad. It's hundreds of square degrees. Astronomers don't want to try to and can't cover anything that well. 
But in August of uh, that year, of the second run last year, we uh, added the Virgo detector, and that allowed us to basically see an event immediately. This is August 14th, 2017, to see the same event. They didn't see it very well because they're not as sensitive as us. But you can see us alone only did it this way. This is down to something like uh, 60 square degrees. Still not fantastic, but good enough so astronomers could look. Of course, it's black holes, so they didn't care. <laughs> but we were really lucky. So we made this work. We were going to turn off LIGO at the end of July because Virgo wasn't working, wasn't working, and wasn't sensitive enough. They talked us into running one extra month while they got themselves on. They got on, we did this. This picture was enough to satisfy that we thought they're funding agencies so they could still exist. And then we got really lucky because three days later, by the way, all 10 of these, none of them have reported any electromagnetic counterparts. Not surprising, but they have. Then on August 17th, three days later, we saw this event. It was localized. With three of them, we were able to localize it to 31 square degrees. And it's close. It's 40 uh, megaparsecs away. And uh, it uh, lasted, lasted for minutes. You're hearing the signal. If you're really good, you can hear the little chirp at the end, which I'll show you. This lasted in our apparatus not for two tenths of a second, but for two minutes because it's a very high frequency. This is the three detectors. It's a frequency time plot. And as we get near zero, you should hear a little chirp signal. I'll stay quiet. You can try. OK, so that's the signal. Amazingly, uh, we were lucky that we were there. Using that alone, by the amplitude, we could tell, not with some ambiguity, because we don't know the spins of these things, how far away it was. And it wasn't very far away. It's only 40 megaparsecs away. From some other magic coincidence, it turns out that the Fermi satellite was looking in the same direction for gamma ray bursts at that time. And two seconds later, uh, our signal is, uh, is shown here and coming up. This is the Fermi signal. And two seconds later, they saw evidence of a gamma ray burst in the same part of the sky over here. So this is there where they were looking. This is where we see counting the Virgo detector inside. By the way, I, I'm really proud of this because I suffered with astronomers telling us we can't point well enough for them to ever do anything for at least a decade. And then the first event ever seen, we did better than they did. So. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, at the same time, within two seconds, so this thing happened within two seconds, the best instrument we have to look at gamma ray bursts, sees a gamma ray burst, a short gamma ray burst in that part of the sky. Uh, that got followed up. And then we were credible, of course, because they saw something. Signals, messages were sent out to astronomers around the world. I think more than 1,000 instruments of one type or another turned themselves or did what they had to to look at the sky. That's the biggest mobilization, I think, ever in astronomy around one thing. It varied from uh, gravitational waves to uh, neutrinos that didn't see anything, x-rays, gamma rays, radio waves, so forth and so on. Uh, those all are going to come at different times. So the time scale is shown here. We are the earliest because it's a merger. Nuclear physics happens and sends out high energy gamma rays. That happened 1.7 seconds later. And then later, you get the, depending on what the nuclear physics is of this coming together, you get the other signals uh, at, different, at different frequencies. I showed here x-rays or radio glows afterwards and so forth and so on. So all of that was done. There was a nice phenomenological model done by somebody at Columbia University of what he called a kilonova. A kilonova, we know what a supernova is. A kilonova is this. Uh, and the predictions of the kilonova based on one event, this is all we have so far, look very good. So I just show the different colors and how they were supposed to fall and the theory versus the data. 
it all fits very well in the kilonova emission signals are there. So that's all very uh, nice phenomenologically, but of course it's only one event. To go even further with one event, uh, we may have solved an interesting puzzle. Uh, physicists always have to get, tell you the reason for everything because that's our job. And we've always had a really unsatisfactory way to explain how heavy elements got into the Earth. So where did the gold, platinum, and so forth come from that's in the Earth when the Earth was formed? Uh, we know that most of the universe is made out of hydrogen and helium, so it's not that. Most of the heavy elements must come from stars, which work by the fusion process. Fusion process starts by burning hydrogen, helium, and works its way up lithium and so forth. Eventually, it gets to about iron, and fusion doesn't work anymore. And so that's as high as you go with fusion. At that point, the stars burned itself out. Gravity wins, which was pulling in, and the star collapses, and you have a supernova. So where did the, where did the elements above iron come from? In the Earth. We know how they come in the lab. In the lab, we've had people who are experts at making heavier ones and getting the, the ones in the bottom of this named after themselves or something by, by bombarding usually neutrons on a heavy element and then making a heavier one, and that's what's done. So now, for the first time, we see a process by, remember, that's neutrons, and we're talking about neutron stars. So all of a sudden, we have a process where two neutron stars come together. These heavy elements, uh, very compact nuclear bodies are hitting each other. And you can try to calculate then how many, uh, how many heavy elements were made. And people have done that, but keep in mind it's only one event that we've seen so far. And uh, the majority of the ones we care about the most, for example, platinum and gold, probably come from earlier versions of a neutron star merger. That's kind of nice. And uh, in fact, in the calculation, the neutron star merger is a tremendous source of, of uh, gold. This merger that we saw, if you believe it, created 100 Earth masses of gold. So that's it. Right on. By the way, I get interviewed a lot these days, and the reporters just love this part of the. <laughs> now let me spend a few more of my overtime minutes talking about where we are and where it's going to go next. So this shows how far out we can look in the three detectors that are running right now today. I just took this off one of our displays last night. And uh, what's shown here is how far out we can look with if we're looking for neutron star binaries. That's kind of our way of telling what our sensitivity is. And you remember that one was at about 50. This is the Italian detector. It looks at about 50. And the two LIGO detectors, which are different from each other, only for a kind of technical reason of not having put one feature in one of them that's in the other one, are about 140 uh, megaparsecs. Our design is over 200. This is the number of events we have now. We're running a third data run. I'm not showing that data very much because we don't do it when we're online. I told you it takes us a long time to fit, but you can see the amount of Events are going up quite rapidly. We now have uh, about one a week that we're accumulating right now of something. You know, we analyze it later to see what it is. However, we immediately have to classify it. So this is the classifications and events that were sent to astronomers, which we have to do within seconds or minutes from when we detect it. We don't really do a detailed analysis. We've pulled back seven. So we've made 33 announcements in 26 weeks. Seven of them, after we looked at in, in some detail, we pulled back. We're getting a little better at that. They were mostly at the beginning of the run. And then we, the astronomers want to know more. They don't want to know just, do we see something? And then they're going to go turn and look. Uh, they want to know whether it's interesting for them to look. So they want more information. We're not very good at that yet, and we make mistakes. But these we classify as black hole, black hole, which is most of them. This is from the present run that's going on. Uh, black hole neutron star or neutron star black hole, which we haven't discovered yet. But as candidate, we have a candidate. Or terrestrial, meaning we found out that it's just 
uh, background noise. And these are the, the ones that we put out so far, only they're not really identified at this stage that we've discovered a black hole neutron star, for example, which we haven't seen yet. It's just that in the quick online analysis, one of the objects was less than three solar masses. Three solar masses is kind of the magic number where the amount of gravity that a, an object will have can't be strong enough to be a black hole. So we don't think black holes exist much below three solar masses. So anyway, in progress, we're doing better. Uh, we're going to do better at pointing. We're presently uh, building another version of LIGO in India. They're also uh, making a version of an interferometer work at the Kamioka mine where the big neutrino experiment is in Japan. And when we put those all together, we'll go from today, which is the upper left-hand corner, those bands are kind of how well we can see something happen in the sky, to something that looks like the bottom right-hand corner by about 2025. So we can point very well to do what I started talking about, multi-messenger astronomy with almost anything we see by about 2025. We also have other sources, of course, that we're looking at, and I'd be negligent to not mention them. We only talked about binary in spirals. Of course, there are other sources. For example, the, the uh, collapse of a star, supernova. If it's, we don't know how uh, much of a quadrupole moment there will be, how non-spherically symmetric a collapse is. The calculations aren't very good, so we can't tell. The big computer models that do uh, supernova collapse basically assume spherical symmetry, so they're useless for us. So it's kind of phenomenologically done. But there's burst signals. These are the ones that we know about. There's uh, uh, periodic signals, for example, spinning neutron stars in our own galaxy. To the, they give radio signals. To the extent that they're not totally spherically symmetric, they'll give uh, gravitational wave signals. And different from the ones that we see now, which are transient, once we see one, we can follow it for uh, as long as we want to measure its parameters. And lastly, and maybe most interestingly, is the possibility to measure stochastic background from the early universe. And that's a big goal for the future. This is just to say that we know we're improving LIGO. It's still being improved. And we're working on how to make a better detector. And we're not yet, despite the fact that people didn't believe that we could do what we've done, we're not limited by nature. And we know that. We're limited by our own ability technically at this point. And so we're under uh, progress in designing the next generation gravitational wave experiment. And we're at the level of not having to, to invent technologies as much as try to find some optimization that can be affordable. So this is an example of a study that was done in Europe. We have a slightly different ideas in the US, but we work together, of making a triangular interferometer underground, about 300 meters underground, where it's totally quiet. Um, the arms are longer than ours, 10 kilometers. The triangle gives you some interesting features and the ability to concentrate on different frequency regimes. Most importantly, it's cryogenic. If we lower the temperatures, which is not easy to do, but run it not at room temperature, but low temperature, it can be much quieter. And with a triangular one, we can concentrate on frequency bands and make it sensitive at the cost of not seeing the other ones. If we do that, in the study here, the US one we call, well, let me just show you what's on here. This is where we are when we're uh, in the present design. This is how far we can go with the present sites without building a new detector. This is what we expect to do with a new detector. And with that, we can see, for example, the black holes that we're observing now all the way to the edge of the universe, which means now we're seeing redshifts of nothing. And we'll be able to go to the very earliest times and see how they evolved with time. And I think eventually the best way to see back to the early universe is with gravitational waves because they didn't get absorbed. OK, just to mention, like astronomy, we'll be able to do gravitational waves in different frequency bands. And in fact, that's underway. So in space, the project is called LISA. It's a, a European project, but NASA will be a minor partner. And it 
covers, instead of 10 hertz to 10,000 hertz, it covers 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 4 hertz. It's three satellites, I'll show it in the next slide, that are separated by uh, uh, a million kilometers. And at even lower frequency is what I call PPTA here. That's a bad acronym, but it's, it's a pulsar timing array, looking at the fact that pulsars give very constant clocks. If you measure a whole bunch of them and the clocks change time a little bit, it's because the time to get here got warped by the passage of a low frequency gravitational wave. And so people have tried to do that now with you know, present instruments and they can't do well enough. But I think within the next decade, we'll see the ability to do this. So by the 2030s, a little bit like astronomy, maybe not very well yet, we'll be able to cover a very large a band of frequencies for gravitational waves. This is just a picture of the one of LISA, in, which, by the way, they've proven the technologies quite dramatically by putting a satellite that did the really hard jobs already in space. The hard thing is, you remember I had the free masses? How do you create a free test mass in space? And they show they can do that in a test flight last year. So this is the uh, ultimate goal, I think, is to go back and the one tool we have that can go back to the earliest times in the universe to understand really what the Big Bang was all about, how particles formed, maybe why we have a matter-dominated universe even. The instrument I think we have eventually to do that not immediately, is gravitational waves. So I think that's where we are. And just like Galileo started things, these two guys, I think, began um, what is now the birth of multi-messenger astronomy. Thank you.